Coming up on this Wednesday edition of Daybreak, South Korea counter-proposes to the North to discuss the resumption of their Mount Kumgang tourism project next month, stressing the reunion of Korean families is a separate humanitarian issue. Pyongyang had earlier said the tourism and reunion issues were linked. A UN inquiry commission on North Korea's human rights abuses kicked off a five-day hearing in Seoul Tuesday. Two former Labour camp inmates testified about the brutality and inhumane treatment they endured before defecting to the south. Plus, over in Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood condemns the arrest of its spiritual leader by the military-backed interim government. With the growing unrest, Washington is reportedly considering to cut off aid to the North African country. Daybreak begins now. You're watching Daybreak on Wednesday, August 21st, and I'm Chi Yusan here in Seoul. We begin this morning with Seoul's response to Pyongyang's proposal to discuss their suspended tourism operations. Following days of consideration, the South Korean government suggested the two Koreas meet on September 25th at the Mount Kumgang Tourism Park instead of this Thursday as the North had proposed to negotiate reopening the mountain resort, which has been shut down for more than five years. Seoul's unification ministry said that discussions should not be rushed and that the two sides should first focus on normalizing the joint Kesang Industrial Complex and successfully rearranging reunions of families separated since the Korean War. The two Koreas had agreed to discuss family reunions on Friday, but they have yet to decide on the venue of the meeting. While Seoul stresses the reunion and tourism issues are separate, Pyongyang earlier Monday urged the South to agree to both talks this week, saying the two issues are linked. The UN Special Commission investigating human rights violations in North Korea held its first hearing on Tuesday with direct testimony from those who experienced abuses firsthand. Our Hwang Sung-hee brings us the stories of the North Korean defectors who want their voices heard and for the world to take notice. North Korean defector Shin Dong-hyuk lost his finger after guards at Camp 14, one of North Korea's many prison camps, cut it off as a punishment for damaging camp property by mistake. The 31-year-old was born in Camp 14 and spent most of his life there until his escape, with no sense of freedom or rights as a human being. A camp prisoner must ask for permission from the guards before eating scraps off the ground or even before he or she can eat a rat that they found. Around 200,000 people are believed to be imprisoned in North Korea's prison camps today, where they are malnourished or even worked to death. In an effort to end such widespread abuses of human rights in the communist state, the United Nations Commission of Inquiry began a five-day hearing in Seoul on Tuesday. The three-member panel, headed by Michael Kirby, will collect evidence that supports the alleged violations through testimony like that given by Shin. The plans going forward are to conclude the series of hearings in Seoul, uh, in Korea. Uh, that will be uh, in the middle of next week. We then go to Tokyo in Japan. Uh, where the focus will be substantially upon abductees in that country to North Korea. North Korea has denied any human rights abuses and has said that UN inspectors will not be allowed on North Korean soil. The investigation, the first of its kind, is not expected to have an immediate impact on improving the dire human rights conditions in the North, but it's believed it will help publicize the issue globally and perhaps add pressure on the regime. The commission is a flicker of hope for not only myself, but for those living in prison camps and in North Korea. Those in the North don't know that such an investigation is taking place, but we have big hopes about it nonetheless. The commission will wrap up its investigation by the end of this year and will give its final report to the UN's Human Rights Council in March 2014. Hwang Sang-hee, Arirang News. 
And on to the latest in international efforts to end the North's nuclear programs. South Korea's chief nuclear envoy Cho Tae-yong will hold talks with its Japanese counterpart Junichi Ihara in Seoul on Thursday. Korea's foreign ministry says the two will exchange views about the current state of affairs on the Korean peninsula and ways to address Pyongyang's nuclear weapons program. Speaking to reporters in Seoul Tuesday, a high-ranking official said there's a need to figure out exactly where the North stands in terms of denuclearization through talks with other six-party member nations. The official added without Pyongyang's willingness, the multilateral dialogue would not be able to resume. President Park Geun-hye will set off on an eight-day trip to Russia and Vietnam next month. She will hold talks with world leaders at the G20 summit in St. Petersburg before traveling on to Vietnam for an official state visit. Attention now lies over whether she will meet with her Japanese counterpart after reports emerged Tokyo proposed a leaders' summit at the G20 meeting. Our presidential correspondent Oh Jin-ju reports. President Park will make her debut on the stage of multilateral diplomacy during next month's G20 summit in St. Petersburg, Russia. The president is scheduled to arrive in the Russian city on September 4th to attend the two-day leader summit on the 5th and the 6th, where she will discuss the most pressing global economic and financial issues with other world leaders. During her stay in St. Petersburg, she is also expected to hold bilateral summits with some of the leaders. The presidential office of Chang Wei-da told reporters that negotiations are being made through diplomatic channels to set up the summit schedule, but could not confirm who she might meet. Attention is being drawn to whether President Park will meet with Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe amid ongoing tensions between the two nations surrounding historical matters. Reports quoting diplomatic sources say Japanese Foreign Minister Fumio Kishida expressed hope to Korea's ambassador to Japan Lee Byung-gi on Monday that the leaders could meet during the G20 summit period. However, Korea's foreign ministry made it clear that nothing has been decided as of yet. After wrapping up her stay in Russia, President Park will make a state visit to Vietnam. On September 9th, she's scheduled to hold a bilateral summit with Vietnamese President Thuong Thanh Sang and will seek ways to further strengthen cooperation in various fields from trade to security. In particular, the summit agenda will focus on developing the two nations' strategic cooperative relationship, pushing ahead with FTA talks, and increasing cooperation in nuclear power plant projects, all part of President Park's push for sales diplomacy. President Park will also pay a visit to Ho Chi Minh City, where some 1,800 Korean companies operate and some 70,000 Korean residents live. Oh Jin Chu, Arirang News. President Park geun has emphasized that exposing the underground economy should be the first step in securing the funds needed to fulfill her welfare pledges and not tax increases. In a meeting with our senior secretaries Tuesday, President Park said the government should first root out tax evasion through a crackdown on the black economy and make sure tax revenues are not used for less urgent matters. She also expressed her regret over the restrictions added to the Financial Intelligence Unit law, which allows the nation's tax agency to access the intelligence unit's transaction and settlement data when tax evasion is suspected. The president said the revision has made it hard for the government to raise the amount of revenue it needs. If you want the latest news from Korea and around the world, return to the negotiation. President Park Geun-hye plan given the current circumstances. On your way to work or at home, Defense Ministry. The legislature will convene a. Tune into Daybreak on Arirang TV. Prime Minister Shin Do Abe said Tuesday. The turmoil in Egypt was exacerbated on Tuesday as the most senior leader of the Muslim Brotherhood was arrested in Cairo. He is the latest in a series of Brotherhood leaders to be detained by the country's military-backed interim government. Our Kim ji has the latest developments out of Egypt.
The Muslim Brotherhood was quick to condemn the arrest of its leader, Mohamed Badie. A spokesman says the arrest was a plot against the 2011 revolution that ousted former President Hosni Mubarak. The interim government accuses Badie of murder and inciting violence. The army backed authorities detained Badie near the site of a protest camp in Cairo after suppressing rallies there that were filled with supporters of overthrown President Mohamed Morsi. Egypt is still in a state of emergency. Emergency with more than 900 people killed since last Wednesday, following a brutal crackdown on pro Morsi supporters by the army backed interim government. The turmoil in Egypt has deeply alarmed the international community. The United States is deliberating whether to cut the 1.6 billion U.S. dollars worth of aid it sends to the country every year. U.N. Secretary General Pan Ki moon has called for the release or at least a fair due process for Morsi, Egypt's first democratic democratically elected leader, who was also detained by the military last month. The interim government, supported by Israel and Saudi Arabia, says it will resist any external pressure in its internal affairs. Kim Jeon, Arirang News. Despite concerns Asia's third largest economy is headed toward a crisis, India says it has no plans to ask the International Monetary Fund for help. The Economic Times, an Indian business newspaper, quotes two finance ministry officials as saying the Indian government is not even considering asking the IMF for money. The U.S. Federal Reserve's plan to taper its stimulus program has sparked an outflow of money from emerging markets worldwide, and the Indian rupee has been among the hardest hit. The rupee has been Asia's worst performing currency so far this year and plunged to record low against the greenback on Monday. September promises to be an exciting month for tech fans as industry giants Samsung and Apple are gearing up to release new gadgets. Apple is reportedly planning to launch two new iPhone models early September. The Washington Post reported Tuesday that the U.S. tech giant has asked its supplier in Taiwan to begin shipping both high-end and low-end iPhone models next month. The higher-end version will reportedly feature a metal casing, while the lower-end one may come in a plastic frame. Not to be left out, Samsung will launch the latest incarnation of its Galaxy Note tablet-sized smartphone on September 4th, along with a smartwatch. In a new discovery at Japan's crippled Fukushima nuclear plant, authorities have found at least 300 tons of highly radioactive water leaking from a storage tank. The plant's operator, TEPCO, says the leak is separate from the recent reports of contaminated water flowing daily into the ocean. Officials say the water is emitting a radiation dose of 100 millisieverts an hour. That is about 350,000 times greater than natural background levels. Japanese officials have classified the latest leak as a level one incident, the lowest on an eight-point international scale for nuclear and radiological events. Relations between Korea and Japan have been on a bumpy path in recent years, but group of Japanese social media reporters have come to Seoul in a bid to smooth out future relations. Atim Yang-gil spent some time with the young vis visitors and shows us how this group may spark new dialogue on the web. This is a group of social media reporters from Japan. They are on a five-day tour across Korea starting Tuesday. And on the bus ride to Seoul, they are full of enthusiasm. We are so excited to be here and we are going to have such a great time. <laughs> but they are here not just for fun but with a purpose. My mother is Korean. I did exchange student programs at Seoul National University, and I've come here so I can later report on Korea through our social networking sites. Korean culture, I'm especially interested in uh, Korean buildings, uh, for example, the Korean temples. I want to compare the difference between Japanese temples and the Korean temples. These reporters will study Korea's indigenous cultures, religion, and the daily lives of Korean people. On the first day, they held a reunion with Seoul National University students who had gone to Japan prior to their visit. 
After that, a welcoming ceremony was held at Korea's foreign ministry, followed by a trip to the royal Toksu Palace. Each social media reporter will have the duty of writing about Korea once they wrap up their trip here and go back to Japan. Amid the fun and excitement, the reporters still have some sensitive issues they want to discuss. Japanese youth have a lot of interest in Korea and the relations between the two countries. I think politicians from both sides should stop wrangling over the complicated historical issues and move on with the future. Currently, Abe is very popular in Japan since he's striving to revive Japan's economy and bring back confidence to the Japanese people, but he's causing some friction with neighboring countries. These young reporters will potentially play a role in molding future relations between Korea and Japan, and each person seems to be happy to play that role. Kim Young-gil, Arirang News. In some medical news, a group of local scientists has developed a new way to treat broken bones. They've produced new types of screws to pin bones that the body can naturally absorb. Our Connie Lee has more. A broken bone takes a while to heal, and even after removing the cast, the patient sometimes needs to go through a second operation to remove the metal that was used to repair the bone. But patients can soon avoid this second operation with a new development by local scientists. After eight years of research, scientists from KAIST and Asan Medical Center have developed special bone screws that do not need to be removed because they naturally disintegrate into the body. They are made of magnesium calcium alloys and iron. When we tested it on a rabbit for a year, two-thirds of screw disintegrated into the body and then disappeared. For now, we do not see any negative effects on the body. Researchers say that for a centimeter of a bone screw to fully disintegrate into the body, it takes about six months to two years, or more than long enough for bones to heal. However, the shortcoming of these bone screws as of now is that they are only half as strong as metal plates made of titanium. Currently, titanium metal is the most common material used to fix broken bones. Because the bone screws are not strong enough for other parts of the body, it can only be used in the face for now. But in the near future, we plan to make the screws a bit stronger so they can be used in dental implants. Since last month, these special screws have been tested on patients' broken fingers. And so far, they are only approved for clinical trials. Connie Lee, Arirang News. It's not every day that traditional Korean music instrument masters demonstrate their lab of skills to the public, but that's exactly what's going on at the National Kugak Center in southern Seoul. Our cultural correspondent Park ji went to check it out. 63-year-old Ko hung has devoted the past 44 years of his life to making traditional Korean string instruments. Designated as important intangible cultural asset number 42, Go says the entire process begins with a high-quality royal impress tree that's grown for more than 30 years and then dried for about 10 more years. Only then can he proceed with making a 12-string kayagum or 6-string common go, both of which date back more than a thousand years. Silk threads spun from cocoons are used for strings, and all the ornaments are dyed with natural ingredients. Altogether, he has to go through about 300 different processes by hand. The craft of instrument making is all about sound. Every step of the process takes a lot of effort in order to produce a good quality sound. Korea has some 20 kinds of traditional drums in all different shapes and sizes. While most countries have a musical tradition of using some sort of drum, Korean drums boast a unique pattern and design, mostly notable by its taeguk or the yin-yang symbol. Korea has also other traditional percussion instruments, pyeonjong and pyeongyang, a bronze bell chime and stone chime instrument, respectively. 
These instruments were originally derived from ancient China. However, Master Kim Hyun Gon, who has spent nearly six decades crafting musical instruments, says the Korea developed its own design and sound in the 15th century. Korean instruments are significantly different from ancient Chinese instruments in their patterns, colors, and shapes of the chimes. This rare demonstration by the nation's intangible cultural asset masters is open to the public through this Sunday at the National Gugak Center in southern Seoul. Park ji Arirang News. And a good Wednesday morning to you all as we kick things off with the big match that took place earlier this morning. Of course, PSV Eindhoven taking on AC Milan during the UEFA Champions League playoff had Park Ji Sung making a season debut. Now, he did play 69 minutes in the match before being subbed out as both teams drew 1 1 after 90 minutes of play. And so moving on to yesterday's Major League action where LA Dodgers lefty Ryan Jin went after his 13th win of the season. But the bigger news was the fact that he was going up against a rival for the NL Rookie of the Year honors, Jose Fernandez of the Miami Marlins. Now with the LA Dodgers taking on the Miami Marlins at Miami, it looked to be a pitcher's duel until the third inning when Yu gives up two runs in the inning as the Dodgers trail early on. But the Dodgers come back to tie it up in the sixth inning before Dion Jin gives up the third run of the game as the Marlins cruise through after that. Now Marlins win it 6-2 as the lefty pitches seven and one-thirds inning, giving up three runs on six hits while striking out five. And of course, staying in baseball, but back here in the nation as we take a look at some Tuesday night KBO action. Now, the Lotte Giants were able to shut out the lowly Hanwha Eagles 4-0 with the NC Dinos pulling off an upset win over the Tucson Bears 8-6. So with that said, two big series taking place as well as we take a look at the Samsung Lions taking on the SK Wyverns. Of course, shifting into the game here, first inning of the game, Eason Yup sack fly to center field, scores the first run of the game. Check out that play. one nothing Samsung Lions. Stays that well to the fifth inning. Chung Nu RBI triple, scores Pak Chin Man. And what do you know, tied ball game. Next up, Cho Dong Hwa at back, sack fly to left field as SK takes the lead here. Before King Gang Min at bat, two run double to deep center field gives SK the 4 1 lead. Sixth inning, Samsung's Park Han E RBI double to deep left field cuts the deficit 4 to 2. Eighth inning, SK continues swinging. Park Jae Sung RBI single extends the lead in this game before Kim Sung Hyun makes it 6 to 2 with an RBI double to deep left field. We're not done yet. Here's Han Dong Min at bat this time deep to left field, back, back, back. Two run shot and it's eight to two SK Wyverns. Samsung gets a few runs in the eighth inning, but SK still holds on eight to four with the other big game to look for to next. And here it is. This is the big game El Mexico series. LG Twins taking on the Nexon Heroes first inning. Lee Jin Young grounds out to second, scores Park Yong Tech for the first run before Kwon Yong Guan makes it two nothing LG with an RBI single to left. Bottom of the inning, here comes the next in heroes. Bases loaded. Kim Min Sung walks two to one LG Twins before Yu Han Jun at bat strikes out, swinging inning over. Third inning of the game, here's Kwon Yong Gwan once again. This time an RBI double to left field makes it three to one before Kim Yong Yi makes it four one with an infield single. Check out that hustle play. Bottom of the inning, Lee Tae Gun starts off with a solo shot to deep center field. Back, 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 back. Gone and it's four to two LG. I'm gonna shift over to the fourth inning. LG running away with this one. Chung Sung Hoon RBI single to left field makes it five to two LG Twins. Eighth inning things get interesting. Bases loaded for Nexon. Yu Han Jun singles to center, cutting the deficit here. But here's Ho Dong Woo grounds one to first place. He's gonna throw this to home and the play. He's out. 
Next batter, Song Jin Man here. Grounds one to first base as well. Touches the back and to second. Double play. LG would hold on to win this one 5 to 3 as they now have the first place spot in the league. And with that said, that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs. Good morning to you. Well, just like yesterday, ongoing heat wave will sweep the country with temperatures soaring mid to upper 30. So again, the mercury won't drop too much for the western parts of the country, while East will have another cool day with the easterly winds blowing through. But I assume the wind is not cool enough to make people in the east less stressful because the discomfort index shows that even though it's a, a, the wind is blowing, everybody will be feeling very stressful by this afternoon. Now, tomorrow, the range of daytime high is a bit lower than today. Well, this is because of the nationwide rain is on tap in the afternoon, so hopefully this rain will help ease droughts in the southern provinces and Jeju. But it looks like it's not going to be a shower, just a few raindrops, though. But I'll be sure to give you an update on this. Well, right now, there's a thin layer of cloud coverage across the nation, so we are waking up to mostly to partly sunny skies and it's gonna be a very sunny day so don't forget your sunblocks and here are the readings for today now the daytime highs in Seoul and Daegu will hike up to 33 degrees Celsius that's 91 degrees in Fahrenheit and Gwangju will soar to 35 and Busan should be slightly cooler at 31 now moving over to other places it looks like Jeju and Daejeon will hike up to mid 30s and Tokyo and Mountain Gungang will be topping out at 27 now that's all for me at this hour. Have a great day and back to you, Yuzan, in the studio. Thank you, Jian. And those are the stories we have for you at this hour. Thank you for watching.